When it comes to talking about big gaming news from this past week, obviously the major focus for a lot of people right now is the PS5 reveal from last Thursday. And I already did one video talking about, you know, my immediate reactions to that reveal, what I thought about some of the games and the design of the system. I want to talk about a lot of the news that came out after that, however, as far as how some other companies are responding and also just kind of re-examining a little bit some of the stuff that was announced and why some of it isn't quite as hype-inducing as a lot of people were first feeling. But first, let's talk about Microsoft. When it comes to talking about next-gen systems, obviously the big debate right now is PS5 versus Xbox Series X. We're learning a lot more about both systems as time goes by, and it's informing people's decisions about which one they're more interested in. And the PS5 reveal event was obviously a really big moment for PlayStation. While they haven't done any kind of major press conference or anything quite yet, Microsoft has already begun to address and try to respond a little bit to what was shown in the PS5, at least indirectly. We do know they have some other press conferences already planned out happening later this year. For instance, July, they'll be doing another 2020 showcase where they'll be focusing on some first party titles for the Series X. But for now, the big thing they're focusing on trying to draw a little extra attention to is smart delivery. Yesterday, as part of a large blog post along with a video posted on YouTube, Xbox was once again focusing and bringing light to the concept of their smart delivery service. And this is definitely meant to be somewhat of a response to some reactions people have had to the PS5 event. I'll talk about that in a moment. But the main idea was to, again, clarify what exactly smart delivery is and why it is one of the really cool upcoming features of Series X. If you haven't really looked into what smart delivery is, it's actually a really cool concept. I think it's one of the smarter ideas that Xbox has had as far as what to add to the Series X. And the idea is this. There's always going to be those games that are cross-generational releases. There's going to be a title that comes out right now on the Xbox One, and it's going to get some kind of Xbox Series X release that is going to look and perform better because it's designed for a more powerful system. In the past, when it came to cross-generational releases like this, it can be a little annoying for some people because you could buy a game that you're really excited for and then six months down the line, a new system comes out, a new version of that game comes out that looks better, it runs smoother, it's at better frame rates, and you have to buy the game all over again. And in some cases, it won't even allow you to move the save data between them. You have to start all over again. That's really annoying. What Smart Delivery does is it embraces a form of forwards compatibility, where you can buy a game right now on the Xbox One, and if that game is re-released on the Series X in some form, you just automatically already own it, whether it's because you bought it digitally, or even if you own a physical disc and you pop it into the Series X. Xbox is going to recognize that and allow you to play the Series X version of that game instead of just a backwards compatible version of the Xbox One version, which is really cool. Obviously, there are going to be some games that don't have Series X versions, those will still be just regular regularly backwards compatible on the Series X, which is nice, but for those games that do get dual releases, you're going to be able to make use of the full power of the Series X. Along with re-clarifying what exactly Smart Delivery is, Xbox also announced all the games that are currently planned to be supported by it, and have also said that this list will continue to grow. And the ones that are currently on it are a pretty strong good starting list. This list includes both first-party and third-party titles, and there's some really big hits amongst the list that I want to highlight, including Halo Infinite, Cyberpunk 2077, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2, Yakuza Like a Dragon, Metal Hellsinger, and a lot more games, including some big hits from the Xbox One, like Gears 5. Now, I think there is a very deliberate reason why Xbox chose to re-clarify and re-announce this feature right after the PS5 reveal event, and that has to do with the lingering question I think a lot of people have about cross-generation support on PlayStation 4 to PlayStation 5. The PS5 reveal had some great looking games, some of which definitely would not work on a current gen system because they're making use of technology and abilities the PS5 has that prior systems don't, specifically the SSD. However, there are definitely some games they showed and talk about where a PS4 version isn't really that unrealistic. And I think the main game that's bringing this question up for a lot of people is Spider-Man Miles Morales. There was a little bit of confusion about what exactly was going on with this title when it was first announced. A lot of people thought it was a full, brand new, proper sequel to Spider-Man. Then there was an interview where some words were chosen that made people think, oh wait, no, we're just getting a Spider-Man PS5 remaster that includes Miles Morales levels. And then it was further clarified that no, Miles Morales is its own standalone game. It's just based on a lot of the same technology and features as the original one, but of course leveraging some PS5 upgrades, and it's going to be a smaller adventure, something very similar to Uncharted Lost Legacy. The thing is, while it's cool that it's going to make use of PS5 technology, if it is basically just a standalone expansion to Spider-Man, are we going to get a PS4 version? There hasn't really been any kind of hard confirmation from Sony about how that's being handled, and it's leaving a little bit of mixed feelings for some people where this is a game that could definitely have a PS4 version, 
but it might not because Sony wants to give you a big name game close to launch that makes you have to upgrade to a PS5. And so what Microsoft is trying to say in response to that by highlighting smart delivery is to say, hey, we're not going to force you to buy a brand new system right away this holiday. If you want to buy one, that's great. But if you'd rather just play some of those big hit games right now on your Xbox One and upgrade whenever you want to or you feel is the right time, that's a choice that's up to you. And I think that's a really smart thing to highlight. And I think there's a few other games that are worth kind of re-examining a little bit from the PlayStation 5 reveal event. Not that the games didn't look cool or awesome, but the idea of the fact of how far out are some of these titles. If you look at the plans for a lot of them, a lot of these games, while super exciting sounding, have to be announced release dates, they have 2021 release dates that might be, you know, near the end of the year, not necessarily early on, and some games are very far in the future. A really good example being Square Enix's Project Athia, which Look, Square Enix has a history of doing announcements way in advance, but they did that teaser, and that is a game that is currently planned for 2023, which knowing Square is always up to changing. Again, I think all these games looked awesome, and I think they're gonna make for great releases when they do come out, but it's interesting to really think about what the actual launch window for these two systems is gonna look like. Because if Xbox's upcoming July event actually highlights some more releases that will be in holiday 2020 and not necessarily something far in the future, it actually may look like while PlayStation 5 has announced a lot more games in general, Xbox might have more things up front. I'm not necessarily saying that I think the Xbox is actually in the lead when PS5 just looks cool, that's not at all. I'm just saying that I think the competition between them for this holiday season is gonna be a little closer as far as what each system offers you, but people don't see it that way right now because the PS5 reveal event did such a good job of building hype, whether or not those games are coming out soon or much, much later. On the subject of the PS5, there is one other little bit of news that popped up yesterday during an interview on LinkedIn, which is now disappeared, one of the engineers for the PS5 discussed the fact that the UI is going to be a complete overhaul of what we know for the PS4's UI. In comparison to Xbox, who is trying to maintain a very similar UI on the Series X, it sounds like Sony is going to do something very different for the PS5's interface, and hopefully it's a big upgrade. I liked the PS4's all right, but it was just a bit too simple for me. I really wish there was a little more control and customization over it, and hopefully that's something that this new UI brings to the table. They did tease it ever so quickly during the reveal event, but it was just the opening kind of boot up screen and that was it. So gonna be really interesting to see if there's any further announcements in the near future regarding what that UI is going to look like. Now, while the PS5 reveal was, of course, the biggest piece of news from this past week, there was a lot more that got announced, so much so that I don't have nearly enough time or brain capacity to talk about every single game that was released, or announced, I should say. Uh, and the reason being is because this was the big week for a lot of the let's call them replacement E3 events. Because E3 was canceled this year, a lot of other smaller events were planned by different companies to make up for that loss, and a lot of them happened this past week because it's around this time that E3 would have happened. This includes IGN's Summer of Gaming, which was a mixture of game trailers and interviews, the Guerrilla Collective, which was a collection of different, more indie-focused announcements, mostly trailers, but some actual little gameplay walkthrough segments as well, the PC Gaming Show took place, and GamesRadar had their own little Future of Gaming segment. There were a lot of game reveals that came out of this event, either with completely brand new games or just new looks at gameplay for games that we didn't really learn that much about. I highly recommend that if you didn't get the chance to watch these live, that you watch some of the archived footage of it and just kind of just even scan through and look for some games that look cool to you. There's a lot of different stuff they showed off. Some really big ones for me include a longer look at the gameplay for the remake of System Shock. We got the beta announcement for Baldur's Gate 3. Kind of. They said it would be available in August. They think, they hope, maybe. It depends on some things, including, of course, whether or not COVID gets better or worse, all that fun stuff. And while it was leaked a week ago and actually got posted on Steam before its official announcement at the PC Gaming Show, Persona 4 Golden has made its way to PC, which is great because that is a series that has been very much locked on PlayStation systems. That particular game was only on the Vita, so it's really great to see that find a home on the PC. Hopefully that means we're gonna see some more ports. While PC ports are great, I know that this has kickstarted a lot of thoughts for a lot of people of when can we see some of these games come to the Switch. One other game reveal that happened that wasn't a part of actually any of these conferences is that we now know EA's next upcoming Star Wars title, Squadron. This was accidentally leaked on the Xbox store and not too long after they ended up launching a trailer just showing off kind of a hype reel of the game. It looks like we're gonna be seeing a more in-depth actual gameplay reveal for this at EA's upcoming EA Play, which is this Thursday. EA Play is one of the remaining digital presentations that is taking place instead of E3. There's a couple others worth pointing out, like I mentioned, Xbox is doing their event in July, and Ubisoft is doing their own digital event on July 12th. 
As far as game releases this week goes, there's actually a pretty good variety going on. Today marks the release of Disintegration, which there was kind of some initial hype for it when trailers first came out. It kind of got quiet for a while and started getting talked about again during these past conferences. It's this FPS RTS hybrid that I'm really interested in taking a look at. It has both a single player campaign and multiplayer options. We're also getting the release of Summer of Mara on PC and Switch. This is a farming simulator, kind of based on some of the ideas of things like Harvest Moon, but takes place on an island and focuses also very heavily on X exploration. We're also getting the release of Pokemon Sword and Shield's first DLC on Wednesday, and this Friday is of course the release of one of the most anticipated PlayStation titles, The Last of Us Part 2. That's it for the news this week, as well as some more games to look forward to. As always, you guys can also follow me on Twitter. I got a couple other videos planned for this week, including an unboxing of The Last of Us Part 2 Special Edition PS4 Pro on Friday, so make sure you don't miss out on that. Otherwise, I will see you guys next Tuesday with another news wrap-up. Till then, see you later.